Welcome to the Smart Grid Seminar. Uh, this seminar is sponsored by the Bits and Watts Initiative. Our speaker today is Professor Ariel Lightman from Monash University in Australia. Uh, good morning, Professor. It's uh, 8 a.m. over there. Uh, yeah, so I, I want to remind everyone that our next and final uh, presentation for this quarter is in two weeks. Uh, and the start time uh, again is 3 p.m. The speaker is uh, Gregor Verbich from University of Sydney. Ariel Lyman is an associate professor in the Department of Data Science and AI at Monash University. Since 2020, he has been director of the Monash Energy Institute and leads the reliable, affordable, clean energy for 2030 program. This program optimizes Australia, Australia's electricity grid through customer engagement distributed energy resources and network integration. Professor Lyman also led the, the um, Monash Sustainable Microgrid Feasibility Study, leading to a collaboration between Monash University and state government of Victoria on a 30 million microgrid program. His current research focuses on optimization and machine learning based decision support tools for operation and planning of uh, smart grids. Uh, internationally, Professor Lyman led the, the Australia Indonesia Center Energy Cluster to tackle the challenge of integrating distributed storage and renewables. Dr. Lyman received his PhD degree from University of Queensland, Australia. Uh, today, Professor Lyman will talk about Monash University Net Zero Initiative and Transactive Energy Management. Let's welcome our speaker. Thank you, Jinwo. And um... I'm uh, very happy to be here and uh, really honored to, uh, to be speaking to your, uh, to your seminar community. And uh, I'm uh, actually um, excited that my uh, lovely colleague, Gregor Verbich from University of Sydney is gonna, going to be um, presenting on actually transactive energy uh, management as well. And um, in fact, it's, it's a nice uh, lead and I will be doing a, a more high level discussion and uh, some of the work that uh, Gregor is doing, we are also uh, incorporating into some of my students' research. So um, it's really nice uh, <laughs> the way you've staged this. So um, uh, I've titled my um, uh, uh, talk, talk Net Zero Transitions in Campus Precincts, and that's specifically case study of the Monash University Net Zero Initiative and uh, Transactive Energy Management Living Lab. Um, I won't have time to, and I didn't really uh, choose to go into the details of the technical uh, options of how you design a transactive energy management scheme. Um, uh, I, th I think uh, the setting the context is is actually a nice um, nice lead in, particularly as as Gregor will be um, uh, giving you some more technical aspects. Um, so yeah. Uh, I uh, will uh, set the scene here. Uh, we have a, a major challenge, uh, as you all know. I'm sure um, we we have a 1.5 degree target uh, that to meet, and that really means in practice. This is from a recent um, performance report from the UN on how we're we going, and uh, we're not going that great. Uh, we need to be following more or less the green trajectory or at very worst the, the amber trajectory, the 1.8 degree maybe. Um, we don't want to get anywhere near beyond two degrees C. And so things are urgent. Um, and that means in practice, global emissions should be heading towards 50% lower by 2030, only nine years away now, 80% by 2040 and 100% by 2050. Um, that, that to me means that every good researcher uh, any ability to uh, get involved in this space should be working on some aspect of this problem and i mean broadly speaking not just engineering or science researchers this is one of the biggest challenges facing humanity today if not the biggest um so yeah call to arms uh, uh, as i say so um a little bit uh, of background on monash uh, where we started to get uh, we've always had a um, sustainability um, vision but uh, we just started to get really focused on climate change and um, uh, uh, and, and you know energy related sustainability in the last five years we um, led the Australian community and perhaps the, the world's uh, university community in establishing a net zero emission target by 2030. 
and for which we received the UN Momentum for Change Award uh, in uh, the Climate Conference in 24. And um, this is not uh, to boast, although we, are, we do like to boast as, as academics in universities, but this is really just hopefully to, to um, get other universities thinking about the same thing. And the reason we do that is not just to be able to say it, but actually there's a lot of uh, learning that can happen from these um, programs. Uh, and we, because we have much more control of our facilities as universities and our campuses, and they're very diverse facilities, almost mini cities in some cases, like uh, Monash and uh, Clayton campus, where we in normal times have about 50,000 people working and living in one place. We're one of the biggest universities, biggest university in Australia, but, and relatively uh, possibly one of the biggest in the world because we are unusually large in, in numbers. And so, uh, yeah, it's really like a mini city. So we, we do this under the auspices of the Monash Energy Institute, which is established uh, five or so years ago as a partnership between three faculties and um, the uh, facilities division of, of the university, which we um, represented by our Net Zero Initiative, which is the initiative I helped found. Um, the uh, Faculty of Information Technology, where I am, um, sort of information technology is a, is a sort of a synonym for computer science uh, here in Australia. Um, although sometimes people do get confused in course for uh, IT support. <laughs> uh, <coughs> the Faculty of Engineering uh, and uh, the Monash Business School. And so with their generous support, uh, uh, we, we are able to coordinate researchers across Monash um, uh, and uh, coordinate their engagement with the industry and government communities at, and the other communities outside the university. So we focus on three impact areas at developing new energy solutions, accelerating the energy transformation to meet climate objectives and ensuring the consumers are central in this. And uh, we apply our um, a range of capabilities under five themes, um, although we are as at the moment um, splitting out out of energy resources, uh, hydrogen, uh, green hydrogen is a separate theme to ensure we give this uh, proper attention. We have several major initiatives in various stages of delivery uh, that, that we focus our work through. One of them is the Net Zero Initiative, which I'm going to talk about. We have our industry partnerships um, uh, a little center called the Grid Innovation Hub, where it's a subscription-based collaboration with um, um, uh, various industry partners, including our um, uh, grid utility here in Victoria, Osnet Services, uh, uh, large um, precincts operator, vicinity centers, and um, a consultant, global consultant, Wally, uh, which is engineering and um, business consultants. We have uh, a partnership with Monash, uh, with Woodside Energy. It's an Australian, Australia's only oil and gas company. And then um, also the Race for 2030 CRC, the Reliable Affordable Clean Energy for 2030 CRC, which uh, I might slightly correct, um, which I'm not the, the directing the whole um, center that's got a CEO. It's established as a separate company, but I direct the um, uh, Electricity Networks program, one of four programs within it. So these are some of our partners we work with. Uh, um, you said busy and is out of date. That's now become Wally um, and um, Australian Energy Market Operator and, and others. So what is our um, uh, Net Zero um, program all about? Creating grid interactive precincts is, um, is, is another way of looking at it. Um, so I'm going to focus uh, mostly on the microgrid, which is the research oriented aspect of it. But I will just talk mainly about, um, initially about the other uh, aspects, which is um, the net zero aspect. So uh, Scott Ferreira is credited with the um, uh, with these slides. He's the director of the net zero initiative. So um, we have investing about $100 million of Monash money to decarbonize our grid through various ways. We were expecting this is done before COVID. A student growth forecast will probably be revised. We, <laughs> We're, uh, we're at about 50,000 on all Australian campuses. We're expecting about 80,000 in 2030. This led to a real serious look at what our energy costs were, which were going to explode. This led to a clear business case for um, reducing emissions through basically um, uh, energy efficiency retrofits plus um, 
uh, local generation, rooftop solar, which forms part of our uh, microgrid living lab. And then also, um, of course, this is the lesson, a big intense energy intensive precinct. You cannot generate all your energy locally if you want it to be renewable. For example, UCSD can do that at times, but that means they've got a great big uh, natural gas, uh, open cycle gas turbine, now cogeneration turbine on campus which um, they can do that, but we chose not to do that, particularly in Australia, that is never going to be economic with our gas prices. So we know we uh, source energy from uh, a renewable, uh, from a wind farm in Victoria. We will be basically net zero, um, uh, net zero uh, emission electricity by 2022. Um, and then we need to electrify all our gas burning hot water um, and in that switch, we'll be 100% renewable on at zero by 2030 or earlier. So this is a nice little wind farm here. Um, so this is our campus and uh, it's got three sub grids. And one of these grids is called, um, we call ring three. This is where this purple, sorry, um, this purple uh, area is um, highlighted. This is our uh, uh, microgrid and we call it a microgrid but uh, I know it's debatable whether it's really a microgrid because we don't plan to disconnect it sometimes and that's the technical definition of microgrid. Um, the objectives, uh, the, the main features of it are flexible buildings. This is our research area using where we use the transactive energy management concept to coordinate um, building flexibility plus storage. There's some energy storage, one megawatt hour of vanadium redox hybridized with lithium ion and um, solar, about one megawatts of solar, probably more, and um, some EV charges. So what, what, what do we actually want this microgrid to do? We want it to be able, to, well, in it, we um, optimize investment in local generation assets. We cost effectively want to integrate local electricity supply with grid supply, provide dynamic control over quantity and quality of multi-directional supply. It's exporting and importing in a way that um, also takes into account market signals, whether uh, dynamic pricing based or some direct um, curtailment uh, or you know, grid constraints, you know, or critical peak pricing even and things like that, and do it through providing access to local resources. So to do that, sorry, we, um, uh, partnering with a, a Spanish um, IT infrastructure company called Indra or Minsight, who have a, what they call an active grid management platform, which is essentially a, a high reliability, high throughput um, uh, publish and subscribe platform with edge computing devices, which we are putting on each of our uh, 22 buildings plus the uh, energy storage uh, and our um, and our uh, inverters um, on our solar set, so we can then coordinate all of this in a um, efficient way. And so this is a nice visualization of the campus by a student of one of my colleagues, Sarah Goodwin. Sarah is a um, uh, is a uh, visualization expert working in the energy space, and this is actually a very early stage diagram which we keep using. So, but it still looks very nice. They they, they do a lot more interesting work than that. Um, look her up and there's a um, uh, ACME energy conference being held soon where she's hosting a workshop on energy visualization that's um, ACME energy and so you see here the um, the red lines are the ring we call it a ring but of course it's not a ring it's um, uh, but it can be switched um, it's designed in a ring format so we've got our um, uh, resources there and then we've got our um, facilities, um, sorry, our customers. These are all our faculties, our sports fields, our performing arts centers, our residential services. We have a few thousand students living on site in our dormitories. We've got, uh, of course, our stakeholders, the, the, the uh, governance um, folks for, the, uh, for our uh, uh, university. And uh, we've got a lot of on-campus uh, mostly eating facilities. Um, there's a lot of people where people need to be fed. So we've got a lot of independent businesses who are um, required to, um, to, you know, require electricity. And so, yeah, we have a city here basically, and we can show, and you can show too, and I'm sure um, Stanford doing things towards that. Many US universities are and others around the world um, that this is, there is a way to manage this, um, uh, this infrastructure in a, 
way that is innovative um, in order to provide true sustainability outcomes, true decarbonization. So you know, here's our happy students graduating, um, as well as working in, a, in the lab. So one of the things that is, I'm not going to focus on from a research perspective, but it's very important is actually moving our buildings up to high energy efficiency standards. We are uh, relatively unlucky here for various reasons that uh, in Australia, our building stock is, um, is really quite poor in energy efficiency. Um, we're the least energy productive country in the world from a building and industry perspective, which is quite um, uh, challenging. There we go. Thank you. There's my coffee. Uh, um, and uh, 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 it's because Australia traditionally had very cheap electricity and i think we just didn't worry about uh you know wastage which is not good but we are here so we need to really lift our game on um reduction of our energy use from buildings so a lot of our uh, emission reduction on campus will come from uh this um as well as the electrification of our thermal precincts some of which is being done through some more novel technologies district solar heating replacing natural gas heating of hot water. And um, uh, we have a, a, an old you know, gas-fired boiler system that we will replace with electric um, uh, heating that, um, that is, of course, powered by our renewable energy that we're sorting, sourcing locally and off-grid. Now, that's all great, but it's uh, uh, not, not, not so cool from an uh, electrical engineering smart grid perspective. Um, and so uh, when you uh, get to the next stage, this is the actual project that we're doing with, with Indras funded by, the, um, uh, funded by the Australian Renewable Energy Agency, as well as Indra themselves and Monash together. Um, so this is sort of the plan. This is how we're doing this. We, we are now basically um, uh, somewhere around here. We've um, installed all these edge devices. We've got simulators, we've got the battery installed, we've got our EV charging stations, and um, we are now um, integrating all these things with our peer-to-peer, um, -peer, or sorry, not peer-to-peer, -peer, but transactive energy management algorithms. And it turns out that, you know, if you want to do it in, in practice, you start having to make some serious design choices and practical design choices about what um, algorithms you use. You, you, you know, it's, it's nice and theory to play with all these peer-to-peer -peer concepts, block with blockchain or without blockchain or um, complex um, uh, distributed uh, uh, energy market type mechanisms. But when it comes down to implementing it in the hardware and software that has never been written before, you have to make some interesting choices. So uh, these are the things we are working on this year. This year is sort of the crunch year for integrating everything and getting it to work. So what is our vision? Well, in the end, we want collectively our, our buildings on that campus will be one commercial sized power, virtual power plant. And um, which both, which, you know, where more and more demand can follow supply. The dream is that ultimately the whole campus's um, demand will follow the, the um, true gross production of our share of the uh, wind farm plus our solar that, um, that we're procuring so that we don't have to buy the balance from the wholesale market, which of course adds that price volatility and therefore puts a premium on our costs. So um, whether we'll get there ever is, is a question, but we will strive to get as close to that as possible. Um, uh, this is just another slide and again reminding us that we have this, um, this is the technology stack we, we're effectively building. Um, Underlying it is, is the edge devices connecting to all our resources. Then we have the Indra Active Grid Management System, which is, um, um, I remember the acronym now, I think it's, um, D, oh, it's DDS, uh, is the, the um, publish subscribe high reliability um, platform, which is actually based on some military technology um, uh, uh, developed either by um, Indra or um, sourced by them, the, the, the platform. And then, so you know, this is to make sure that all your information packets uh, get to where they need to go through a, a flexible approach. 
Um, and then um, on top of that, this is where we put our uh, transactive energy management or market, if you like, um, layer, which is where we build our intelligent agents um, in a way that basically can just be deployed into these edge devices with some central coordination agents, which uh, integrate with some of uh, Indra's other software, but some of it is actually a new layer of effectively cloud-based, um, uh, hybrid cloud and, um, and edge computing uh, distributed management uh, software. Um, this is another view of it. We've, um, this is more like the, the traditional um, electrical engineering computer science view. We've got the flexible distributed energy resources here. We have uh, the kind of actors that will ultimately um, play in this space. Whether we might have an aggregator who may be different to an orchestrator and then the planner, which would be the, actually the owner of the assets that needs to understand the, the, the um, future outcomes of uh, the, the pricing signals. If you look at that on a translator to a wholesale market a paradigm, uh, we are thinking these days, not we at Monash, but, but the world is thinking that somehow we will take these wholesale um, uh, spot markets with, with their uh, derivatives markets um, down to the distribution, uh, electricity distribution level. Now, I think there's a lot of work to be done here, and I'm pushing very hard uh, here at Monash and in the CRC that we really need to ask ourselves what this means, um, because computationally and engineering-wise, it's it's a diabolical problem, uh, and uh, computational uh, challenges are everywhere there in terms of speed and um, uh, resilience of the algorithms and uh, cybersecurity of the algorithms. So here's an example of how we actually put this kit together. The, this is our um, uh, Red T flow battery um, founded by an Australian alum and manufactured, uh, you know, found based in the UK, uh, now part of, um, uh, uh, I just can't remember the name of the company that they merged with recently off the top of my head now, Solar Locally. And these are our um, edge devices here built in by Indra. And so uh, the objective is we have these uh, sensors and systems or systems in the sensors that um, uh, operate, uh, connect to them. Then we have information coming in and then we have our uh, uh, local resources. And then we are building an IoT enabled um, uh, set of uh, um, uh, IT solutions or hardware and software solutions then in the end can help us flex the demand of our whole campus with a, a market-like um, request coming in between two. What we want to do is collectively between time one and time two, reduce demand by X kilowatts or you could frame it as X percent. Now, this all sounds very nice in practice, especially if you have, um, you know, most of your demand can be offset by batteries. If you're talking about sort of traditional residential virtual power plant kind of concepts, but we have um, um, some uh, large commercial site uh, type buildings, which are really not designed to flex at all. They're managed by very black box building management systems, um, which are actually um, very hard to, to uh, modify, retrofit any sort of intelligent control over. So we're actually doing some work around using reinforcement learning to learn the behavior of these buildings uh, together with some forecasting methodologies and optimization uh, so that we published a paper a couple of papers on that um, which i can um, share with with uh, chinwu later for um, putting somewhere on on your website but i won't go into detail but so so but basically we have very complex um, uh, physics problem underneath all this to to integrate with um so and uh, this is another view of how we're thinking we the the original pretty much the current paradigm is passive or direct passive direct management there's a um, direct control mechanism we are moving through active management which is a more distributed control but it can still be basically um a, without any real choices for the consumers or any sort of market concepts and then we are moving through that through to the transactive energy paradigm where there's actually consumers preferences can be encoded in their um, local um, 
energy management systems and in a way that uh, flex is based on pricing signals through some sort of coordinating mechanism. And so one of the paradigms we're exploring is the concept of microgrid electricity market operator, which we're about to complete research on funded by the state of Victoria's uh, government. And um, uh, there, there are some preliminary reports, which I will, I will show you to uh, later in the talk. So um, uh, a little bit more about the architecture of the um, uh, active grid management system. You can find more information on Minsight, uh, Indra Minsight's website. They, they've got some pretty interesting um, uh, and, and impressive uh, technologies. They've partnered with Intel to develop some specialized chips to, to run these um, edge computing devices that are called OneSight node number one. And um, they sit at all levels of the um, of your active grid management uh, front -end network. And on top of that, they're um, integrating a um, distribution management system called PRISM, Advanced Distribution Management System, which you know uh, distribution companies use to, to manage grids, but uh, we will be using it um, mostly as a power quality management system to ensure that whatever decisions are made from an energy management point of view do not lead to uh, power quality issues like voltage excursions or um, or uh, potentially harmonics created by uh, some kind of strange control of the inverters we might want to do. So this is the the, uh, the PRISM system was in fact um, acquired from another company called, uh, if I remember correctly, ACS, a US um, uh, independent, quite innovative company. So um, uh, that's pretty much it about our um, uh, transactive energy management project. There are several reports that you can uh, look at on our um, uh, on our website, um, and um, there's a link at the end of my talk to the page where you can download these from. So um, and now, what I wanted to do at this point is just say, well, okay, this is very nice. This is, in, in a sense, the if we have a parallel, this is our living lab. This is a hardware of our research computer. Uh, we need to write the software. The software is the research itself. So I'll talk about a few examples of the research we're doing related to this. Um, uh, the, the research itself that underpins the uh, deployment is still sort of being developed. And uh, I uh, elected to leave that for another talk. But the, the components of that, how they're um, uh, coming together, are uh, I'm going to talk about the sort of uh, research we do at Monash. Uh, research that, that that we get published and it's relevant to, to uh, the research that you do at uh, in, in Stanford and, and in your community. So um, uh, I divide uh, the um, the research areas, broadly speaking, from a computer science perspective into areas which are more machine learning based, are more optimization based. And then um, there's a new concept we are developing here at Monash in, the, in our world leading um, discrete optimization group here, which developed uh, software such as MiniZinc, uh, and uh, now from which uh, pioneered the field of constraint programming <coughs> and um, constraint processing. And so uh, uh, within the machine learning area, of course, you're all familiar with a lot of these things that the forecasting problem is still very much alive. Um, but another uh, area that you're also well aware of is non-intrusive load monitoring. And um, then a uh, slightly newer area where we look at um, how do you use machine learning to detect um, false data injection attacks, the sort of uh, cyber attacks that we think would be quite um, uh, potentially prevalent in virtual power plant configurations where people try and um, disrupt it either for um, uh, uh, for uh, uh, hostile purposes, or just to extract um, value to themselves. And optimization, this is where I, why I don't use terms like AI very much, because uh, really um, AI is a misused term. People often think it's equivalent in, in the greater community that to machine learning or forecasting even, but actually it's much more than that. So optimization um, is where we uh, really where we um, talk about transactive management. And really, we're talking about a form of distributed optimization. So we have some work in that. And, and then some of the other aspects is where we're working on is coordinate inverter PQ control for enhancing grid export, reducing um, 
um, uh, curtailment and minimizing um, uh, voltage issues, which are sort of the, the flip side of the same optimization problem. Normally, um, you will just curtail uh, PV export or even turn the inverter off completely to manage voltage. And so this, this is an unsatisfactory problem. So I'll talk um, um, a solution to a problem that can be solved in, in, in other ways. And then um, we, we work in a sort of predict and optimize space. So we'll talk about that as, as a general concept. So some of the work we do is of course, um, um, maybe more uh, traditional uh, forecasting, but uh, pushing that to the next level. Uh, world expert Rob Heinemann is here, one of the leading uh, demand forecasters in the world. And some of the work that's emerging out of that is, is now towards multi-agent, um, sorry, yeah, residential uh, type forecasting where, okay, in the past, we're just happy to forecast regional demand for the um, uh, independent system operators. But now we need to understand much more what's happening uh, with deeper in the distribution level, especially as we put in um, smart resources. So hierarchical forecasting is an area you might want to look at if you don't work in it already. This is um, some work by uh, my colleague Shuri Pan, who's a, um, a machine learning expert. And this is looking at how do we actually um, detect various devices that are being used, particularly with very low resolution data. Well, a lot of people um, um, really um, do a lot of work with high resolution demand uh, um, records down to a few seconds. A lot of utilities only really have very coarse demand data, um, half hourly or hourly. You know, if you're lucky, they have five minutes resolution. So what can you do with that? And we've shown that uh, with a clever twist of, um, of logic, uh, in fact, inspired by one of my colleagues from Melbourne Uni, um, Lachlan Andrew, we can use machine image recognition techniques to, to detect um, various um, behavior patterns. If you simply turn your demand into a, um, um, into a, uh, a heat map, and then it looks like an image, and we can do edge detection to detect particularly things like pool pumps. You can see here, if, if, you, if it comes up, you've got these blocks um, that come through, and these are actually um, the regular on off loads uh, like pool pumps or hot water systems. So um, this is our cybersecurity work. Um, uh, my student uh, together with um, Associate Professor Karsten Rudolph, the head of our uh, uh, software systems and cybersecurity department here, who's a cybersecurity expert. And we are looking at false data injection attacks on distributed demand response systems. Um, which I'll describe the actual foundation of this in the next slide. And so he's looking to using anomaly detection, which is a form of time series uh, uh, forecasting or clustering to detect excursions away from a typical load pattern. And, um, and uh, yeah, he's, uh, uh, which is, um, uh, excuse the order of these graphs popping up, which is uh, generated by a transactive energy market like mechanism. And um, uh, we find that we, we are able to detect and then um, prevent these cyber attacks through appropriate intervention in the um, day ahead optimization uh, mechanism. So the, the overall um, work uh, we've done on designing an, a market uh, mechanism is um, basically a, a, a highly scalable um, Frank Wolf algorithm based distributed uh, optimization approach which uh, enables us to um, optimize millions of actually of, of distributed energy resources very fast through a somewhat clever application of the Frank Wolf algorithm that um, means we can sort of clear these transactive energy markets in, in seconds. So um, this is work by um, our student uh, Dora Hare, who's just um, submitting her PhD shortly. And there's a few papers on that um, you can find in, in the in the uh, literature. And so another area that I'm very excited about is the work of Peter Lucis, who's a PhD student also just finishing up and it's saying, well, what can we do if we could directly control the some of the inverters in an energy in a distribution network and to manage voltage? And you can see some of these simulations here which show, well, what happens if you don't do anything where you get these amazing, for a start you get curtailment, the, the solar output would have ideally provided this envelope, which 
fits this little black line on the right, which is on a different scale, unfortunately. So it should be probably double the size. And this is where the voltage starts to um, max out at the limits. And traditional inverters just turn off and then they'll turn on again as voltage drops again and you get all, all sorts of horrible behavior. And what we have shown you can do through coordinated control is smooth this out and reduce and reduce the um, uh, uh, energy, uh, unused energy and, uh, and reduce losses uh, through um, in, in sort of absorption of reactive power at the um, inverter. So um, I'm getting close to time, but uh, I've only got two more slides to go. So uh, I think we're doing well. Um, and so the latest work out of uh, Peter's PhD, which we're about to submit is actually um, a fully integrated model using, um, uh, we, we had to build some of our own optimization algorithms for AC power flow coordinate integrated with inverters control, which have no linear characteristics and then the non-linear losses. And now we've got the batteries in there and we control independently both the inverter batteries and the, uh, sorry, battery inverters and the solar inverters. And um, as well as optimize the charging and discharging for a day ahead voltage secure um, VPP. And I am quite excited that I'm looking forward to the community's feedback on that when I first submitted through reviewers, obviously, and get the typical kind of, uh, we don't understand why you have to do this, but uh, I think we will be able to explain it to them. And I think this is kind of the solution that really um, then brings us to the true transactive energy management paradigm where you have to optimize for both real and reactive power to ensure voltage is, is, um, is properly managed. Uh, and of course, uh, P Peter's approach is sort of command and control. We didn't want to bite off all the different problems at the same time, but um, the, uh, then you turn this algorithm into a transactive energy management algorithm with a distributed optimization base. So um, yeah, you can see again a little bit closer what it looks like. And what I neglected to put here was basically another line which shows a much smoother version of these lines when um, when we do enact the um, coordinate and inverter control. Uh, okay, so you can probably see it here. Um, the the um, uh, the ideal would have been the the, the purple uh, area. This is if you could export all the energy um from the inverters to to the grid the the blue line here uh, area here is the internal consumption of the houses on that uh, distribution feeder and what you find is that basically all the purple energy is thrown away at 90 percent penetration level that's 90 percent of the houses have um, 5.4 kilowatts uh, of solar and uh, as you can see, most of the energy is unneeded by the houses because of this typical load here. And then um, this purple is just thrown away completely. Some of it um, ends up being actually exported from the house, but it's consumed in quite high losses because of that grid is just not optimized for that direction. And then the rest uh, is, is exported from the houses. And in fact, the, the, this is exported through the distribution transformer and to the medium voltage level. Now, if we, this is with volt var, volt watt inverter only. So this is what they would do on their own. It looks like corner inverter control buys us a little bit of improvement by reducing losses, but the lesson is also, well, the energy has got to go somewhere. And if, you know, there's no load, you just have to throw it away. It doesn't matter how clever you get. So, um, uh, there is a layer of um, uh, analysis that we need to do then to say, well, what if happens if we can change things on the medium voltage network to keep that energy flowing, then maybe you can uh, actually export more of this. But if you have standard configuration of distribution transformers uh, built and uh, their protection built for one, mostly one directional energy flow, you get this, but we're able to reduce the energy um, Loss, the line losses by about 50%, right, by, by our inverted control. But that's all you can do. But what we also show is like it gets much smoother. So these fluctuations here, which are already not as bad under pure autonomous inverter control, volt valve, volt watt inverters, are smoothed out. But in reality, some of the systems we will have today will be a mixture of really old inverters that just trip on and off autonomous inverters. And so the voltage fluctuations will get much worse. 
Um, and then this is an example of, yeah, even with autonomous inverters, they still have to turn off because at a certain point, you just cannot curtail back them off anymore. And so this shows throughout one of these simulations, even in uh, on the autonomous side, they're starting to turn off throughout. So in fact, half the inverters in the middle of the day are just off completely. And then uh, finally, um, an example of a predict and optimize uh, methodology using a, quite a different method. Our, um, my colleague, John Betts, who's an inventory management specialist in logistics and using optimization techniques developed for that, which are really quite different to standard, you know, uh, mixed digital linear programming type optimization. And he's able to do a stochastic optimization um, prediction and optimization of battery storage to maximize utilization of, uh, of solar. And he gives you here the optimal sizing and, and um, uh, for securing maximum utilization of solar. There's a um, paper uh, published on that. So um, in, in summary, I guess I've discussed how we work at Bonash on all these different um, uh, transactive energy management uh, systems inspired and led by our Net Zero Initiative and our microgrid lab and um, our microgrid living laboratory, I should say. And so, so here are some links, including um, uh, the microgrid. For, um, uh, so, what am I? What do you mean? The microgrid reports. And then you can see our dashboards showing what our microgrid uh, resources are actually doing and then a bit of information about the Energy Institute. So with that, I'm uh, I'm finished. Sorry, I've gone a little bit over time. I think the timing is fine. Uh, so there are some questions in the Q and A. Uh, I believe the first three are all about uh, using EV. Uh, yeah. So 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 what was what's, what are your thoughts on in uh, on having incentives for incorporating? Uh, EV charging, discharging, I think. Oh, look, so that's something I didn't talk about, but obviously we're going to be working the, on that. The, uh, I think this person is particularly interested in the uh, V2G. Yeah, so um, okay, I didn't get a chance to read all the details here, so maybe if I don't answer all the questions. Um, uh, I look like Lawrence is pretty enthusiastic about EVs, which, which I totally appreciate. We, I'm a big fan of electric vehicles as a as a decarbonization method and also a potential um, grid management resource. And so my thoughts are yes, absolutely. This is a major uh, opportunity. And you know, if I if you if you just cast your mind to what's the world going to look like in 2035, say, um, and I do like to go that far ahead in this case because I think there's some technical and policy challenges that will take a while to resolve. But certainly by 2035, we will see EVs doing a lot of, uh, of the heavy lifting, as we say in Australia, around um, grid management. Now, there's a lot of um, uh, through V2G or V2X is now the whole V2 everything um, concept, V2 home, V2 grid, V2 building. Uh, I don't remember all the different Xs here. So um, does, does that uh, sort of... Uh, answer it um i mean you can get into detail of fast versus slow charges and all that and so um yeah, let me just say that um you, you have to go through stages first of all we just need to make sure um we understand the rate of uptake of evs in different countries and different stages and the grid operators or the grid utilities have to respond through the right kind of investment and the question is how much investment do you need and that's a function of how much First of all, managed charging you have. So clearly just unmanaged charging in some cases is just gonna be very expensive to accommodate. So you need either um, uh, pseudo price-based or price-based managed charging. But then obviously if you do managed charging, you should easily be looking at doing V2G and, um, and that's certainly going to be huge. Okay. Uh, I think the next question is, uh, do did, did, did you have any retrofit to the building? That uh, I think this is for the building energy control. Um, so, so in terms of the envelope and the materials, um, we are certainly looking at that. We are doing some of that. Um, uh, it's not my area of, of um, at least, uh, it's certainly not my area of expertise, but I haven't got the latest information on what portion of our um, energy efficiency will be done through material retrofits. 
Um, and so Jorge sounds like he, he probably knows more about it than I do. And, and you can imagine the decisions you have to make. And it's a cost benefit thing. And, you know, the more retrofitting you have to do, the more disruptive it is to the building uh, operation and time and cost of, of doing that. So we, we're looking at that. Um, and hopefully we'll get the, the op close to the optimal <laughs> decision. Okay. Uh, the next question is how do you assure zero, I think it's zero injection to the network and stability of the system? Ah, uh, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, so, so um, you may have missed a slightly um, brief uh, allusion to the fact that we never operate in standalone mode. Um, uh, we, we elected to not try for that. That's, we, that's why I said microgrid a bit is a bit of a misnomer in this case. Uh, uh, really, it's unnecessary and, uh, and um, uneconomic, uh, basically. You, we're deep inside a large city's distribution network. Um, uh, I know UCSD was able to um, even claim supporting the, the grid during uh, some to, I think it was 2017 or 16 grid events that California had. Um, but really, what can we do? We're an 18 megawatt peak demand campus inside a um, city of 4 million people. Uh, I don't think we can help the grid for stability purposes that much. So we just elect to think of ourselves as a giant virtual power plant where we can maybe support voltage issues at the local distribution network by not exporting or importing as, as much as possible at the right time. Okay. Uh, the next question, have you compared NOx with the three campus efforts? This is uh, Pacific Northwest National Lab, U, U of Washington and Washington State. Uh, um, yeah, so look, good idea. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we do talk to PNL sometimes. We work uh, closely with um, a company here called Stratagen, run by, or uh, the office here in Australia is run by um, uh, Mark Patterson, who is close to, uh, I have to think of his name now, PNNL, uh, who in fact uh, came to talk, who's a transactive energy management guy. Um, uh, and uh, he came and I met him here and he inspired a lot of our research and, and ultimately, in fact, the this transactive energy management work. So in that sense, we, we are comparing notes with him in one directionally, um, but we do seek to then now, once we are um, a little bit further down the track with the actual practice, we will certainly um, keen to, uh, uh, to meet uh, and compare notes. So uh, yeah, next question I, th I think is on uh, pricing optimization. Have you considered that in the in your design? Well, so yeah, the design is very much um, considering price based. Now you can do um, optimization without price. You don't need to have a price. Um, I mean, you have um, shadow prices to the constraints. Obviously, that means assuming you've got the actual real. Um, uh, costs um, that are being um, calculated in your objective function and and uh, your decision variables uh, are cost related, um, but our design is definitely um, uh, uh, de derived from some external market uh, feed through. But it's really one directional, right? We're not going to co-optimize with the wholesale energy market in a way that actually uh, means that our decisions affect the. Um, the wholesale market outcomes. So we, we will probably we will take a wholesale market price and then have a local um, uh, additional price um, uplift, shadow price, if you like, uh, on our constraints. Now, we don't plan for our actual uh, energy users to be see the prices and, and um, actively respond to them themselves. What we are doing is basically developing a utility function or price or demand function for each of our buildings that will be programmed into our intelligent agent, which will be its own basically um, uh, uh, preferences or, or utility function or its demand curve. And then a, um, a, a central price will emerge. So they all are paying the same price and therefore curtailing 
or not um, or flexing or not as their local preferences uh, require. Uh, how are you engaging the university community and Melbourne citizens? Uh, uh, very good question. Um, so we are uh, working through various uh, channels on that. We had a um, participatory um, process where we first of all uh, informed the uh, went through talking to the um, the community, the university facilities management community, and the departmental um, management for all the departments or faculties in the university to explain where we headed. We are still probably a bit far away from actually actioning any real control on campus. You know, that's still a, uh, that's, to be honest, about a year away. That's just tells you how complex this is in a real organization. We can imagine this. We imagined this five years ago. We, we started the work and then, you know, we, we're just getting to the point where this can actually you know, do something on, on camp, campus. So um, uh, this, not to underestimate the complexity in the real world of, of actioning all these things that in the lab, in silico, on the computer, look, you know, oh yeah, we just do that and bang, we'll have a super flexible demand side, which will just uh, absorb all these variable renewables at grid uh, scale. So yeah, not so easy and the engagement is still ongoing. Uh, Melbourne citizens are, are not so much our um, direct uh, constituency as um, you know they just see this campus that, that's a you know relatively small part of the city's demand anyway. But once um, you know we we will have a process where we tell people you know how things are going once the campus actually is flexing uh, some demand and then we will work more with city councils and other um, organizations we are working with them to show how this can be done in their precincts in a, in a equivalent way but um, and I, I believe that there's still a long way to go for this globally and we need to do a lot more of this and universities really uh, need to lead the way because we don't have to worry as much about regulatory constraints about how we manage our facilities and grids so if we all get together, learn from each other, we, we can then show cities how to do this. Um, at least we solve the technical and um, social and economic problem of it. And then they can worry about the, the political problem and the regulatory problem that uh, together with us. And uh, so yeah, I invite all the universities to, to join us in this transformation, in fact. And um, uh, please let us know if you want to collaborate on, on this, if you're not already working on this. We have a team standing by to, to tell you how we did it. Not that we were the best at this. Maybe we were one of the first, but um, um, uh, but uh, there's certainly a lot more to learn. I have to have sure. a follow-up question to this question. Uh, does your customer engagement involve students living in the dormitories? Yes, yeah, we did some actually um, quite um, explicit studies of that through um, a sister organization, Climate Works Australia, which is a, um, a kind of a think tank and uh, policy uh, ad and development advocacy organization. It's actually part of Monash, but it operates as a separate organization. And they did work with us on some studies in, in the dormitories. And if you email me, I'll put you in touch with, with the people who did the study. And um, uh, we've got some uh, reports on that. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, there is, I'm not sure uh, if the uh, cooking. How, how, how do you manage the relation with regulator, regulator and grid operator? Well, so luckily the regulator is not the problem. That's the whole, uh, the wonderful thing about our um, uh, being a campus is we have a private network here. Um, in some cases, you call it an embedded network. So we can do whatever we want from a grid and local perspective. That that gives us a lot more freedom to experiment, and it's a lot of other campuses in the in the world are the same, right? And probably Stanford is the same. Some of them are more urban um, campuses that um, are really deeply embedded into the city's grid and therefore you do have to work with the regulator, but we decided not to bite that problem off yet. Um, we'd work with the regulator to get their views on, uh, and then part of our microgrid energy management operator, MIMO project, uh, which there's some um, interim report there in the links, it is around how you would then do this when you do have to work with the regulator and we had some regulatory experts working with regulators and governments to to tease that out um 
And the second part of the, uh, the grid operator, of course, is a much more challenging thing, even though it's a virtual, it's a private network, because we connect to them, even connecting one megawatt of solar on a 18 megawatt peak demand campus was a problem for them. They're worried about uh, short circuit ratios and, and uh, other things. And it took you know, a couple of years probably to negotiate that with them. So, um, you know, it, it, it's quite, quite diabolical. Um, and so, uh, yeah, don't, um, don't underestimate that. I mean, some utilities are better than others, some more conservative than others. Um, is it a good business to be a virtual power plant? Um, the answer is how long is a piece of string is, is uh, uh, <laughs> the way we say this in Australia. And that's like um, one day it will be uh, a good business at the moment. I don't know that any virtual power plant operator is making money as a as a standalone business. The the costs of enabling this are still um, you know emerging uh, as as any new technology. Um, it's expensive um, when you're learning how to put all the bits together. So so I assume that's the meaning of the question. Um, if you look on pure um, well, actually there is no other way to answer it. I don't think because. Enabling the operation of virtual power plant has got so many layers. Um, the cost of it is, 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 is a function of all these layers. So thank you for the, that question. Think, these yeah, are all good I questions. Think we're, we're at the end of the presentation. If there are no more questions. Uh, yeah, and thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. Uh, thank you for the opportunity and the honor of, of addressing your uh, very um, uh, you know, expert audience. Okay. Uh, okay. So thank you, everyone. And uh, again, our next seminar is in two weeks, uh, June 3rd. Thank you, Chino and Mahila and uh, the rest of the Stanford Smart Grid community. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right.